How about now? Yep. Okay. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is part of our resilience series. So for the second years, you had a bit of this last year. And for the first years, welcome. This is a great opportunity. Um, we've been bringing in speakers, panelists, and the like to talk to us about resilience, especially in the medical profession, how you can become more resilient. We're lucky today to have KCU alum, Dr. Brad Kamstra. He is assistant professor um, and a facu uh, faculty member at uh, South Dakota uh, School of Medicine. And um, he is a family medicine physician. And I will turn it over to him. Excellent. Thank you. Is this thing on here? Maybe. Can you hear me there? How's it going? Good. All right. Well, thank you for letting me come and talk to you a little bit. It's always good to be back on campus. It's changed a lot. Um, so it's always kind of good to be back to see some people that are still around and some are new, and so it's really exciting to see. Um, but yeah, a lot has changed, uh, but also for myself, a lot has gone on. And so that's kind of what brought me to this point of, of talking about things about resiliency. It's one of those things when I sat in those chairs, I would have never thought those things kind of come around. But uh, medicine keeps changing, and so do things that we keep learning and uh, keep building on. So hopefully, as you guys learn more about this, you're going to hear more about it because there's more requirements going on with accrediting uh, bodies, the AOA, AMA, all these different places are recognizing that physicians are having troubles with getting on with their own lives once they've been practicing. But sometimes it just starts right here because sometimes after your first or second year, you get, you get pretty burdened out of things. And so uh, we're, we're, we're bringing more awareness. Uh, we're, we're learning things that may help you and guiding you so you can learn about it, but also what can we do to try to prevent it. And so that's what I wanted to, to talk about. I've kind of titled this Passion for Purpose um, and you'll understand why as we kind of go through this. Um, we'll we'll have, hopefully have some time at the end to, to bring up some questions and other things. Um, so I always kind of start by, you know, why, why are you here? You know, why are other physicians where they are? Why did you come to medical school? It's one of the questions you probably got when you interviewed. You know, why did you want to become a doctor? You know, it's, some of it's for altruism. Man, I just want to help people. And I'm hoping that's what we all want to do. And that's what kind of the, the classic answer is on an interview. But do you really want to do that? Or do you want to learn more about how the human body works? That's why I chose the osteopathic profession. I wanted to learn how the body works mechanically, and then I could apply some manipulation. Uh, maybe you were mentored by a physician, whether it was a parent or somebody in your community, um, somebody undergrad that you got to know very well. Um, sometimes just the stature that physicians take on just by the fact that you have those first two letters in front of your name. Um, some people really wanted to appreciate that. Um, it is a lucrative occupation. Uh, for family medicine, it's not as good as if I was maybe a radiologist or a neurosurgeon, but uh, compared to the norms across the United States and even the world, it, it is, you can make some pretty decent money doing it. You got a lot of loans you're gonna have to pay off, of course. Um, but, you know, some people really have a real interest in science. They want to really pursue the research end and com continue to pursue that end of things, which is really good. And again, family members maybe were in medicine. So a lot of reasons why we got to where we are. So I'm going to go back a little bit. Some of this is a little further back than I was um, for this. But just to kind of remind you where we've come from and where we're going, you know, it's, it's not simple to get into med school, as you know. It's very competitive. You did a lot of work to get here. You know, and these are typically some of the required courses to get to where you are. Um, not everybody can handle taking these classes, um, but it is part of the entrance process. Um, maybe, maybe you took some of these other courses that were recommended because it helped build uh, your, your portfolio, if you will, of, to make things look better so you kind of stood above other people. And so a lot of different classes there. But in addition to, the, to these courses, you had to get above average grades, right, compared to maybe some of your other colleagues that didn't go to medical school or did other things. Um, you had to get recommendations from advisors and other doctors. And so that takes time and effort, of course. Um, maybe you had to do some shadowing because that gave you some experience, got you some letters of recommendation. That takes time. Um, maybe you did some research because that's kind of one of the recommendations from the admissions committees. 
How do I do research? What do I do? How do I get involved? It takes time away from studying. Maybe volunteering, spending time in ERs and you know, maybe other places in the hospitals or clinics. Even just doing volunteering in communities. Very good things to do. And the reason we try to get people to do that is because it shows the breadth of what you know more than just the academics. Um, Pre-med clubs, getting actively involved with them. Um, and of course, you've you got to try to relax and try to be normal, whatever that looks like as a pre-med student, of course. So in addition to all your studying, what do you got to do? You got to take the MCAT, so you got to study for that. Maybe you took a course, maybe you did an independent study, um, but you had to schedule time to study for the MCAT. Takes more time. It's, it's very rigorous. You know, sometimes you're taking up to you know, maybe 18, even some people up to 20 hours um, a semester. And uh, some will take that off. And then you have to get the interview. You can apply, you can have all the grades, you can have all the boxes checked, but you still have to get the interview. And so, of course, that's a stressful process, but it's, it's necessary. The schools want to get to know you, you want to get to know them. And now here's where you are, right? Keep calm. You're in medical school. You've, you've reached that next level. But as you know, especially if you're first years, that that didn't last very long. All of a sudden, you're diving deeper in than you ever thought you ever would. And so it's, it's the next level. But it's a step process. So this is, I like this. I found this slide on a, on a Google search and thought it was pretty good. Kind of what your friends think you are, the Gray's Anatomy, right? If they have no idea how, how it goes in medical school. Your family thinks you're the superhero. Everybody else, like your neighbors, think you're going to make lots of money, right? What you wish you were doing is out on the beach someplace, hopefully not in Florida right now. Um, you think you're kind of invincible in a lot of ways, especially getting that third and fourth year rotations, and in a lot of ways you can be. And actually, you're just trying to survive the books. Um, but once you get to that stage, then the next level is residency. And so it's a process. So these are some different... Uh, Logos from residencies around here, the one I'm at in Sioux Falls. Uh, family, full-time faculty there. Been there for a year. I practiced in a small town, um, actually this community, um, for 15 years. And so I have town's about 3,000 people. So we do, in this level of family medicine, we call it womb-to-tomb medicine. We do the deliveries. We do the ER. We do everything up through the nursing home. So we got to do a lot of everything. And some people I got to visit with. I just came from hospital days up, in, up north there and got to visit with some people about what that, what that looks like. So big process, a lot involved, a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of stress. And so really what we need to do is kind of step back and really look at you know, what I call the three Ps. So what is your passion? And we have to have a passion to get through this process. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and it's really hard. And so what is passion? It's the intense driving or overmastering feeling or conviction that you have towards something. It may be a person, maybe your dog, it may be something you do as a hobby. Um, it's a strong liking or desire or devotion to that activity or person, whatever that may be. But also your passion usually will drive your purpose. And what is our purpose? The purpose defined by the dictionary is an intended or desired result. It's your goal, what you're aiming for, right? We're aiming to, right now, get through medical school. Hopefully, maybe test maybe next week or something. But you're determined, right? It's a set intentional or goal that you have for yourself. And I really like this quote. So you need to allow your passion, which you probably recognize someplace in the past, okay, to become your purpose. Once your passion becomes your purpose, then it will become your profession. And then you will enjoy what you do. And that's what we hope that you can do here. So building part of this resiliency is just that. Having the passion, you've got the passion, you're recognizing your purpose more and more all the time, and it's going to be your profession. It is already. So how do we become that doctor? It's a conditioned process. You can't do it any other way than what we just talked about. I just got done reading a book about Navy SEALs. That's a conditioned process. They have to go through basic training. They have to do what the military does. They start at the basic level, and then those guys move on. There's many of them that do not make it to getting that, their trident. That's a big condition process. You have to do what the military says. Just like in medicine, you had to do those prerequisite courses to even apply. It didn't matter what your, your undergraduate degree was in. 
but you still had to do those prerequisite course. You had to take the MCAT. You had to do the interview. And so the condition process is how we are indoctrinated. We're groomed. It's prep. Some of us that may have started way back in middle school, for myself, it didn't start until I was halfway through college. So that process, even before, can take anywhere from 7 to 15 years. But it's conditioned. We've been processed through that. So in the dictionary, it will have a significant influence on or determine the manner of, or outcome of something. It will bring something into a desired state, right? What's our desired state is to graduate, be good doctors. Um, it sets the pri prior requirements on something before it can occur. You already know what the requirements are. You have to go through that process. Starts in undergraduate, some maybe even in high school, middle school, maybe even younger, where you had some sort of determining factor where you said, I, I am going to be a doctor someday. Um, but in this process, you notice more and more, you may notice already, even undergrad, even now, you have friends, you have your study partners, you have people that you know, do things together with, but more and more, we kind of become lone rangers. But you do kind of have to be a workaholic because you still had to maybe have that job in undergraduate. I even had classmates that still tried to carry on jobs, and that was crazy for medical school. Um, but through that, you kind of become a little motionless, but you do become a perfectionist because you want to do well. You want to get the good grades. You want to do well. You want to show that, that you're doing well. And you kind of become that superhero that was on that one slide. But always that patient must come first. You'll hear that time and time again and never show weakness in that process. Why? Because if your patient shows, sees that you're weak, what happens? They're not going to trust you. If your family members think that you're weak, you know, you're gonna, they're not going to trust that you're a good doctor. So you really have to try to get through this process, but does that make sense? That's the notion. That's the feeling we get as we're going through this process. I'm not saying this is right. This is just the way it is. So what's my story? You know, I started out, like I said, I didn't know I was going to go into medicine right away. I started out, I was going to be a civil engineer. My dad's a civil engineer. I love geometry. I determined second semester of calculus that engineering was not for me. <laughs> you know, that was the weeding, the weeding class for me, just like organic chemistry can be for a lot of people. Um, but it was, it was dry. It seemed a little boring, and it just I didn't see a future in it for me. So I started working hard. I actually was going to do physical therapy until I spent time with an orthopedic surgeon, and I thought, that's what I'm going to do someday. And so that's what I started pursuing. I did a lot of anatomy in undergraduate. I did a lot with kinesiology, biomechanics. And that's what drove me to look towards osteopathic medicine, just really understanding that, the, the mechanics there. So, but of course, I did all the prerequisites, you know, the MCAT, the shadowing, some research at one of the labs we had. But I did teach anatomy for two years in the undergrad. Um, that really got me in good graces with Dr. Stevens. He was the department chair when I was here, and so I, that helped me a lot. Um, but it also, because I knew some of that anatomy really helped me my first year, too. Um, but I, I, I was a sprinter, and I, and I played a lot of soccer, and I wanted to, I actually had a scholarship that I had to let go because of the time commitments that it took to do that. And that's really hard because I, didn't, yeah, I don't have a future. I'm not fast enough to be, you know, at a D1 school or anything like this. So I, you know, it was something I enjoyed, but I had to study. I had to work. I had to do research, those things that I was involved with. My last year of college, I got married. Not a bad thing. It's just, it's, it's another commitment things that you had to spend time together. So got into medical school. I applied to this place in Kansas City. I came and visited, and I showed up, and there's this hospital that's closed. It looks dead. My wife started bawling. She was scared. <laughs> this place, you, you think it seems a little scary, some of the neighborhood here now. You should have seen it uh, back in 92. Um, but it, uh, it was kind of scary. And uh, I was like, wow, what are we getting into? But uh, I really enjoyed it here. Uh, we, we've made a lot of good friends, but it, it was a lot of work. And so I, but I was pretty involved. I was uh, one of our vice president of our class and really enjoyed the process and getting to know a lot of people here. So we was married. My wife had a job. She worked only a few blocks away for a while, and then she worked for an OBGYN group that was close to our place. And they were graduates of the school, so they, they kind of helped her out too. But then she wanted to start a family, and a lot of stresses and those things, we, we struggled through infertility, mostly third and fourth year, but that, that was busy. You know, I was active and um, creates a whole different stress. We did our core rotations out in Colorado. I originally grew up in Denver. 
So we moved a lot for my, for my rotations. And then we have to, of course, you have to decide on a residency. By that time, like I said, I started out, I wanted to do orthopedics. But I recognized that I still love orthopedics, but the care for the patient ended after their knee or their hip or their shoulder, or whatever was fixed, and then they just were done with the patient. And, um, I wanted to move on. I wanted to be able to do more. I liked the continuity. I wanted to be able to help patients and interpret what the orthopedist said, because the orthopedist sometimes wouldn't be very clear to patients of their plans or what was going on. Um, so I was really driven towards family medicine, especially to be in a small community. And so that's how I decided on residency. My residency, I wanted to be able to do a lot of OB. I wanted to do procedures. And I wanted to do that womb to tomb medicine. And so that's how I chose to do residency. Um, made a lot of friends. But the problem was, as I remember, um, about halfway through residency, I went to my 10-year class reunion. All my friends from high school, they're, they got jobs. They got nice cars. They got houses they bought. They've got kids and all this activity. It's like, man. I got all these loans, and I got a car that barely works, and you know, I was just struggling to make ends meet, and so it, it, it made, a, it made a, pr a big struggle, but I still loved what I was doing. I had an interesting stories to tell at uh, class reunion, which other people didn't, but we were broke, but we got by. So it ends. There is an end in sight, so that's the benefit. But residency, loved residency. One problem we had with residency, we had a couple match. I actually knew them. My wife knew them from where I went. I did my residency in Sioux City, Iowa. Now I'm in Sioux Falls. They're different places, close together. But um, they couples matched. A week before we started residency, they separated. And by December, they divorced. We had a class of eight. And so that really created some interesting dynamics in residency. Um, felt like I was back in high school again. Um, but it just created some stress. But you, you know, you're going to lose sleep. You're on call. We didn't have duty hours like they have now, where you're limited on what you can be up and working. Um, I liked exercise. It, uh, you know, I wasn't a freshman 15 in college. It was in his first year of residency, um, so that changed. Um, and we had a, a faculty member that he had it out for me, and uh, that made it really hard. Um, but I had other faculty that built me back up. They, they worked hard. I got through and um, moved on. But you learn a lot, and once. Once we, uh, where our program was, once you had done certain numbers of nights of call, whether it was weekends, um, you didn't have to take call anymore. So I worked hard to get that out of the way. So then I started moonlighting. Moonlighting's great, one, because you get a lot of experience and you're making the decisions. It's scary because you don't have the faculty to rely on, but uh, great experience and you can make some pretty good money doing it. And then we have to decide where we're gonna practice. So as you can see, that condition response or process that I had to go through. Uh, still struggling with infertility also, and through that process we decided to adopt. Um, if you know anybody that's gone through the adoption process, that's a, a humiliating experience, um, just because they kind of tear you apart. Anybody had to do the MMPI, the personality inventory? The, ge the gentleman that uh, reviewed that with me said I failed. I think it was just because I was in residency. <laughs> it's like, you're not fit to be a adopt. So it was interesting to go through that process, but okay, whatever. So, um, but then I go to practice. I ended up in this small town, 3,000 people. They were in desperate need of a doc. So I jumped into a very busy practice right away, and I loved it. I was seeing, delivering babies, seeing kids. We were doing trauma in the ER, codes, all this stuff that I got trained to do, and it was working, and I really loved it. I built it, uh, things quickly. I was uh, the competitor to one of the chiropractors in town doing a lot of OMT, um, learning how to integrate that, not just for back and neck pain, but how can I use it for people with pneumonias and sinus and a lot of different ways. So that was kind of fun. And so I got to spend a lot of time with, with patients. But also, when you're in a small community, in, in any community, really, just being a doctor, you get put at a stature. So you're, you're put on committees. You're kind of... I call it the kangaroo court put in charge of some of these committees because you've got education. You know, in a small farming community, there's a lot of people that don't have a lot of education. So I ended up being the board president of my kid's school. I didn't even know where the bathroom was. You know, so I mean, it's like, wow, you know, I didn't do anything to do this. I don't even know anything about being on an education board or whatever. So, but it was fun. I, got, I learned a lot, but I got to be very involved with the community. 
I started going on mission trips. I went to Romania, I've been to Guatemala, uh, Sierra Leone, and doing a lot of medical type related activities in different countries. And so that was a lot of fun. Got my kids involved with that. Um, interesting, you know, we did infertility, did in vitro fertilization, the whole process. I got pregnant, we did the adoption. And all of a sudden, two years later, infertility broke. I don't know what happened. There was no physiologic reason. My wife gets pregnant. And we end up with, I have five kids now. So a lot of fun, but it's busy. A lot of activities. And so a lot of good stuff. Uh, so I like, like I said, I, I like to play soccer. So I end up a soccer coach. Actually started a soccer program in a small community where uh, people didn't know much about that. So very, uh, very involved. But I also became very productive. Um, Changes are happening of how you get paid. Uh, most of it right now still is there, but it's changing, of, but it's based on productivity, based on procedures you've done, number of patients you've seen. And I was, I was very productive. And so, but I also went to this, what we call the Cornelot College. And this gentleman came and he taught us how to be even more efficient. Things you can say in the, in the patient room that can turn into a visit into three minutes and the patient feels like you've been in there for 30 minutes just certain phrases, certain ways of mannerisms, and I bought into that, and I, and I got good at it. So my productivity continued to grow, and so I got very busy. The other part is you're in a small town. You're at church, you're in a hardware store, you're at the grocery store, patients are coming up to you, they're showing you stuff, and they're like, can you do something with this? And after a while, it gets kind of annoying, but it's like, what happened to HIPAA there? But, um, so it's, it's interesting, because people, people trusted you to do it. And so they really had confidence in you that they felt vulnerable enough to come up to you. So I got really involved with our, our health system called Avera, one of the two health systems in Sioux Falls. And then as a result of a lot of these things, getting involved with the community, I, uh, they really wanted me to run for one of the political offices in the state of Iowa. And so I got to know a lot of our legislators. They looked to the physicians for a lot of answers on a lot of different things. And so getting involved that way a lot of this was by default. I wasn't looking to do this stuff. And so it's just kind of how we get involved. So those are really good things that I did. But what else happens? I'm seeing a lot of patients, doing a lot of deliveries. I'm busy, not spending time with my family. You've got to keep up all these certifications to be covering the ER, to be doing deliveries. You have ATLS, which is trauma life support, ACLS, cardiac life support, BLS, PALS, NRP. All of these are certifications that especially if you're covering the ER and doing deliveries, they're kind of required in a lot of states. Um, they're, they're not hard to do, they're just things you have to kind of keep up. And then of course you always have to keep up on your boards. I just took my boards again last year. That's still a stressful process. It takes time, you want to review, you want to go through the things that you're not seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. CME requirements to keep up your certification. AAFP for the American Academy of Family Physicians and the board for um, you got to do so many continuing education hours um, a year. And every specialty has them. Um, that Cornelick College, I bought into it. But what did I do? I got busier and busier. Um, EMR came into play. When I started, we were doing dictations. We were, um, had paper charts. And so that created a whole new dynamic and really impacted that productivity. It slows you down. Um, meaningful use and PQRS, these are measures that the government has put in place through uh, Medicare and uh, things that they want to see you documenting in your chart. Um, they're necessary if you want to get paid. And they're not necessarily quality measures that we think of in the sense of quality of treating diabetics and hypertensive patients, but they're things that we needed to do, check boxes, so that CMS or the Medicare would pay us. Uh, it takes more time. We were part of a critical access hospital. It's a program the government has in place to reimburse smaller communities in a different way because it's hard to stay up with, with revenue. Uh, but there's, there's paperwork that goes in there. We had EMR. <laughs> EMR kept changing, especially with PQRS and meaningful use. And you're on call, you know, one in four, one in six on the weekends. Uh, patients become more demanding once they trust you, which is okay. But when they want their oxycodone refilled a little early or they lost them, and that takes time, it's stressful. Um, can't get away. I couldn't get out of the hardware store. I couldn't even stay in a lot of places just because I, people would bother you. Um, kids events and EMR. 
There's a, there's a theme there. So, um, so after about seven or eight years, I, I just felt this unrest. I didn't, I didn't know. I was like, God, what is this? And I started going to some different things and thinking maybe, maybe I'm looking for something different. I didn't know what it was. Uh, I went to a course called Completing Your Call. It's mostly geared for physicians that were looking at retiring. And, but there were some younger docs there looking at what is, what's the next step for me, you know. Um, well, then I, I had to step back and say, what is my calling? You know, I had done mission trips. Maybe it was missions. I could have gone to Guatemala. I could, I could live there. It's a beautiful place. There's a huge need. Um, Do Care is an organization in global health. They need docs to run their clinic down there. Um, great place. I like teaching. I got involved. I actually, um, shortly after all of this, I, I went to Guatemala. I got to know some people. I ended up going on a trip, and it was with some students from Rocky Vista. Out of that, I ended up moving to Colorado uh, for a time and actually teaching at Rocky Vista. I thought this was my change. It was great. Loved the teaching. New school. They didn't have a clinic. I wasn't involved as a clinical faculty. And so I, I, I didn't want to give up all that experience I had in the time. And so I, I ended up actually moving back to Iowa in that process. I loved the teaching part of it. Maybe it was something non-medical. I had brothers-in-law that did construction, landscaping, sprinklers. I could do all those things. I know how to do it. That's how I got through undergrad. Maybe I'd just throw it all away and just go do something where I have to deal with all this stuff. So it was, it was definitely getting pretty stressful. But over time, I really realized that I was burned out. But when I was feeling rest, that unrest, I didn't know what that was. It took me about six more years to really recognize that, that I had become depersonalized. I wasn't who I wanted to be. I had patient demands, family demands, and I couldn't do the things I want to do. I, I had gotten very emotionally fatigued. I would come home exhausted at the end of the day. And I'd, I felt like, man, I haven't physically done anything for months, but I, I couldn't get off the couch after work. Kids want to go out and play ball. They got homework. I'm like, I'm done. Um, I even started developing a lot of physical symptoms, and I didn't know where that was coming from. Definitely felt depressed. Fortunately for me, I, I didn't feel the need to drink, but I know colleagues who do, and that was their mechanism. Um, but that certainly could have been an avenue that some people took, go down. Um, but I became very isolated. I'm in a small community. I can't let my nurses know. I can't let other community members know, especially if they were my friends, because if the doc is struggling, man, what can you do? And so I even went to one of the psychologists in town, but I used to be the medical director of that, that outfit, so that was awkward. Um, so you become very isolated. And then it became less effective. I wasn't very productive. I wasn't very efficient, and I, and I didn't care. And so I, I did get depressed. Um, so here, here's some of the signs of burnout. And it's, it's kind of a cliched term that you may read about and maybe hear about more and more. But I didn't recognize this in myself. But these are, and I may have even heard them, but I just, it just didn't resonate with me. And that's why I want people to recognize what these are so you can do something about it before it gets too far gone. They're, you're exhausted, depersonalized, uh, lack of efficiency, become cynical in a negative way. Become, some docs become very disruptive, start throwing stuff and degrading nurses, um, other people around uh, the facilities, um, sometimes even getting suspicious, um, which has its own behavioral health issues. Um, you really felt helpless. I was helpless. Uh, physical symptoms, headaches, uh, GI disturbances, sleepless, you know, maybe gain or lose weight, um, be depressed, even short of breath, which sounds kind of weird, but you're, you're always anxious. So your, your heart rate's going up all the time, and you're just always to Um And sometimes there's, there's risk-taking behaviors that happen with that. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to solve this. I'm going to go buy me a new Mercedes. I'm going to go buy a BMW. That's going to help me feel better. And so even sometimes, I know guys, they started taking up skydiving and you know, some of these things they wouldn't have done otherwise. And so, But kind of highlighted in yellow, I think you can see that. Those were all the symptoms I had, and I didn't even recognize them. And so, but here's the main point. My wife recognized them, and she even tried to tell me about them. I even had friends that recognized that I was always exhausted. I wasn't as personable, even with them when we were just hanging out. And other people probably recognize it. But if we don't recognize that ourselves, 
you know, we're, what are we are? I talked about we're the lone ranger, right? Can't let other people see that we're weak. And so patients are first. I love this from House. I'm not a House fan. I just think he's an idiot. But um, <laughs> mentally, not in his other capacities. But, you know, and this is where I was. I, I didn't feel miserable. I didn't even feel angry. I don't feel good or bad. I just, I just felt nothing. I was numb. I was just going through the motions, just getting through the day. So, but I had to recognize the problem. One of the things I had gotten involved with with the health system was we did this course called Leaders in Ministry. And we met once a month for nine months, and we would do it an overnight thing, and we'd go through this whole curriculum. And I got to know some of the other docs really well. And at the time, I, you know, I gained a lot from it. It was good to talk outside of the clinic. For me, it was just an escape, so I didn't have to be in the clinic for a couple days. And, but we always do this renewal for all the different classes that have gone through us. The uh, administration does the same thing at, at Avera Health. And so we have this renewal every year. And I'd gone to this renewal process, this Catholic organization, and a pastor had gotten up and talked about his experiences and his depersonalization, his emotional exhaustion. He had actually gotten into a lot of alcohol. He lost the church that he was going working with. And he was the two by four. He said something, I still don't even know what it was to this day, but it hit me between the forehead on the forehead. And that light bulb came on. And I was like, Dang, that's what I am. I'm burned out. I knew all the symptoms were there, but I, I needed something to awaken my own psyche to say, I'm burned out. I'm done. And so after that point, and even now, I mean, and just feel layers like the onion just coming off and just recognizing more and more what I did and what I can do to avoid it, of course. Um, so I had to understand my perspective. Where was that? Certainly that unrest of when I went to Rocky Vista. Rocky Vista wasn't a bad experience. It was the reason why I didn't understand that. So the other thing is, um, is getting involved with a life coach. Dyke Drummond is, is a, a burned out family doc. Um, several years ago, he worked up in Seattle. He burned out, and then he started his own organization called the Happy MD. And uh, so now he does life coaching. And so I worked with him. It was mostly on, on teleconferences and Skyping. Um, but he's got a lot of different resources and, and really helped me through a lot of that. It was, it's, life coaching is different than counseling. Counseling is understanding kind of things that have gone on in the past. Now it's understanding what you're doing in your profession and your life to get you to move forward. And so I have actually been in the training to become a life coach now myself. Looking at different resources. There's a lot of resources, especially now, since I kind of went through this about four or five years ago. I actually started opening up to others. Becoming vulnerable is a very difficult word as a physician. Um, and Brene Brown, have any of you heard, the, seen the TED Talk that she does? If you haven't, you need to watch the TED Talk with Brene Brown on vulnerability. Uh, I think as physicians, we need to make ourselves uh, much more vulnerable as in letting people know. Obviously, you're not letting certain patients and those things know, but being able to talk to other people is, is so important. So you don't become isolated. You have uh, significant others, uh, friends, uh, maybe your partners you're working with. You know, I didn't want to tell my partners. I'm going to think they, you know, we see all of each other's patients when we're on call. They're like, they're not going to trust me. The more I found out, if I made myself vulnerable, say, hey, I'm struggling here, they, uh, they understood. Because <laughs> one of my partners, after I left to go to teach in residency, he left and went to be an ER doc. So he was in the same situation. And now I'm becoming a life coach, going through that training, and this light committee, which I'll touch on here in a little bit. Uh, that's, a, that's a committee that's specifically designed at Avera Health for physicians that are, are, are burned out. And I just had to learn some of that work-life balance. That's another cliche term that we hear about, but I didn't know what that was. Remember, we have a condition process to do well, get through medical school, get through residency, and become a really good doctor because the patient comes first, right? But then we forget about us. And so you should come first. Um, and then your patients will, will benefit later. So I had to reach out, um, which is very difficult as a physician. As the personality types that we are, we don't reach out. People are reaching to us, right? So what is that concept of, of prioritizing that? What is work? That's a career and ambition, right? Your lifestyle is the, pl the pleasurable things, uh, leisure, family, maybe spiritual, meditation, whatever that might be. 
Um, it's their lifestyle choices. They are choices. You know, I just chose to continue to pursuing my career. And so what's, we have to choose a direction so we don't go down the wrong path. And so it becomes that balance. Uh, phys physician distress, here's some of the key drivers that I've already touched on, but excessive workload. Some of it we bring on ourselves. We can control it, but I wanted to be more productive so I could make more money, right? Um, become the inefficient environments. There's a lot of efficiencies that can be done with the electronic health record, but there's a lot of things that make you less efficient also. Um, and support for that, it, it's hard to find that. Um, maybe that work-life integration, um, because you do lose some autonomy. Our clinic and the hospital was part of a health system. Those are a lot of good things, but you lose some autonomy with that. You don't get to make certain decisions of what you want. Maybe you lose some of your value and even some of your meaning in work because you become emotionally exhausted. The AOA has been very proactive. Um, they've addressed this uh, starting a, a, about a year ago. They wanted to put resources for training people and, and families, which I thought was really good, is to get families involved with this. You know, because they're the ones that are going to recognize this. And hopefully, uh, you know, if you're burning out, your family's going to burn out because you're going to have to deal with you <laughs> going through all this. But in 2016, they, wanted, they developed this wellness task force that has been put in place. This past July, they started going through what does that look like. And this just, this, I just looked up, you know, it was from August 15 of this year out of the DO. Um, develop, train the trainers. So people like myself, you know, you go to a conference and you go to different continuing education. This is sad, but it's true. But there may be an athletic trainer if you're at a sports medicine conference. The credibility, I mean, he may know a lot of information or she that gives you the information as an athletic trainer. But once the orthopedic surgeon gets up there, he's got all the credibility and that's who you listen to. Even though the trainer's got just as much information or better than what that orthopedic is. So we gotta train the physicians to help each other because we listen to each other and we can speak at the same level. Um, Web-based programs for these families of these trainees as well as the physicians. Um, having a web page that's available. That's what the light program I told you that we have at our facility. But just, just going through this, suicide is becoming very high amongst physicians, and we don't need that. I have a friend, a family doc, and he, he was sick of it. He was done. And nobody saw the warning signs. Even his wife, his, his dad, he's a, he's a pharmacist, and all of a sudden he was gone. So the AMA, they have what's called step, Steps Forward. They put this in place. We've been involved with their study. Uh, almost a year now, um, they were going to do this evaluation where you had to fill out uh, like a burnout survey and then look at it. We're gonna, we'll be done with that in November. Um, but in September 1, work-life balance remains residents' biggest challenge. This is looking at through the ACGME, um, but through their surveys of residents. Um, and the whole idea behind work duty hours was to try to see if they could help not only protect patients, and that's, that's of course important, but to keep physicians from being so fatigued. And so they developed that. Well, it, it hasn't really worked that well as far as those things. Um, but looking at what can we do, not that we have to be always happy and joyful people, but we wanna, we wanna enjoy what we're doing. Um, but the picture on the left is an actual picture of, of an ER physician, had a bad outcome, he was just done. And one of the, the conferences I went to, this is the picture that she posed, because she, she was the, the charge nurse, and this was her doc on the left there that he, he, he's just done. He's burned out, he's mad, he's throwing stuff. You know, this, you know, as a med student, you probably look more like the bottom picture on the right. But certainly, it, it, is, it can be exhausting. Um, it's a demanding profession. It, this is burnout by specialty. I put ours in red in family medicine, but it, it's across the board. Now, this study originally came out on Medscape, um, probably back in like 2014, 2015. Burnout existed before that. It's just that we didn't want to recognize it or admit to it. But since you have a good study, it was a good study, and it showed this, so then it's okay, so now we can talk about it. So the cat's kind of out of the bag, but certainly some of the requirements and demands have come up. Um, but more than 50%, that's a significant number. That's, over half of you here are going to be burned out someday. Someplace along the line, maybe in med school, maybe in residency, 
maybe in practice. This is a burnout survey. We try to get docs to do this at some time or another, just, just for recognition. Where are you on, on this scale of burnout? Maybe just a little bit, maybe it's a lot. Um, Maslach has a burnout survey that probably most people are using and more are being developed. Maslach is a general burnout survey that you can use for any profession. Um, more and more people are trying to gear it more towards medicine just because things do look a little bit different, but the questions are all the same. You know, you're all in that same position. So some of the things we talk about you can do is you, you can try to introduce what we call mindfulness. Taking time away from your day where you can put your mind in a place that's other than the patient or something else. Um, to me, if I heard to do another thing in my day, I'd have told you to find the door. I don't need something else to do. It's important. And so you have to find a way to find a release to get away. Um, but this was done at University of Wisconsin, and uh, some of the things you see from Mayo Clinic, and, and they're doing a lot of, lot of different things of how to, how to deal with this. It really comes down a lot to the resiliency. Um, it's a, the individual's ability to effectively manage the challenges or stressors in life, uh, to bounce back from these challenges, uh, especially major challenges. You know, you can have a lot of little challenges going on with family, with school, with finances, with your broken down car. All of those things are very stressful, but all of them build up, and, and you, you know, even all those little things can make an impact. But even the major ones, you lose a patient, and maybe you feel responsible for it. Or maybe you gave them the wrong medication, the wrong dose, and they had a bad outcome. Those are major challenges. Uh, maybe even just taking care of the demanding patient that wants his oxycodone five days earlier every month. Uh, those are challenging people. And so how do you bounce back from that? How do you keep your shoulders up from that? It, it's difficult because we're always feeling like we're getting dragged down. So here's some of the other protective things to do. Relationships, um, and that can be with significant others. It might be your uh, part partners. It might be other office people. And these are people that you can bounce things back and forth with. Um, maybe it's doing other service work. It's really hard because as a physician, we're already doing service work. But maybe going out in the community and, and doing cleaning up a yard or doing something like that, we feel like you actually accomplished something. And you can see an end result. Other life skills, build in humor. I started just putting doctor jokes around uh, more for the clinics and, and nurses. Um, it just breaks it up. Me and my part, other partner, we, uh, we would just have a good time across the clinic and just do stupid stuff just to get the nurses to look, look at life differently through the day and just, you know, we just had to break it up ourselves a little bit. Um, even, even the love of learning, that sounds terrible to you right now, but, um, but not, not just learning the medicine, because you always want to you know, try to keep up with changes that are going on, but learning to do other things. Um, and competency, self-motivation, all these things are just things that are out there um, as far as resiliency. The LIGHT program, this is something we developed about four years ago at Avera Health System. It stands for Live, Improve, Grow, Heal, and Treat. And so that's become our resiliency and burnout type of organization that we have at Avera. And we've, we've got some recognition from this. Uh, there's a coalition for um, physician well-being, and they've actually developed an award. And it sounds kind of corny, but um, hospitals look to get awards like the Magnet Award, and that just shows certain things that you've done to show you've gone above and beyond other people. We have this Medicus Integra, which says that this hospital is doing something to protect its physicians. Um, but I'm on this committee. This is also the committee that we're doing to, to train physicians to be mentors, to also be life coaches. Um, so it's to provide, and we, we talk about residency, but we're working more. The, the med school in Sioux Falls has another, uh, he's a, also a, a family physician that does some of this work. Um, but it's to be preventative, to be proactive. Let people know that we know you're hurting, that there's things going on that we can help support. It may be only mild, but we don't want to get it to a severe degree. And just do whatever we can along the way. But also promote that culture of reaching out, being, being willing to be vulnerable and ask for help. And that's really hard, uh, even as a family doc. But some of the, I call them a little bit, maybe, I don't know, high risk professions. But I, I've mentored with, with an oncologist. And uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty stressful area. 
and he, he got pretty belligerent, and uh, he's pretty stressed out. And we kind of worked through some different things and different ways that he's starting to recognize of some of these things that, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess I am kind of being a jerk. And it's, it's hard to admit those things, but um, we get there. Now this is a public website. It used to be on the intranet of, of that, but that's, there's lots of resources like this that hospital systems and schools and residencies are building more and more. We have access to Dyke Drummond videos, but also uh, suicide hotlines, as well as uh, addiction type um, resources. Um, this is the Medica, Medicus Integra and the coalition. Um, but uh, the award is built on, on quality, what kind of quality you're doing, but also based on what are you doing in, in the sense of, of the resiliency. Uh, it's, a, it's a cultural change. It is that resilience, and, it, and it's learning. And it's a learning in a different way. Um, these are other resources, the Coalition for Physician Wellbeing. I'm a part of, we meet uh, once a year. Dyke Drummond's the Happy MD. Uh, Love for Medicine, again, there's, there's lots of different people doing this. Um, the E-Physician Health has got great resources. And so they're really, it's really neat things that are out there that people are really trying to do to help support each other. And the, the benefit online, obviously, is you can find some of these resources. You can get in some blogs or some Facebook sites that are, are a little more confidential, but you feel comfortable unloading, if you will. So um, if you can't figure out your purpose, figure out what your passion is. What did I talk about first, right? It's your passion that will create your purpose. If your passion will lead right, you right into your purpose. I like that uh, I like that quote. And so if you're really getting dragged down, if you're feeling like, man, I'm done with this, you get through second year and I didn't do so good on boards and um, hang in there. Just, just go back to what is, what is it you're, why did you come here? Why did you start this process? It's very important. Um, it's, it's a significant thing. This is part of my passion. These are my five kids. So until about two months ago, they were, I had four teenagers at one time. That's interesting. <laughs> but they're fun. Two of them are in college now. Two of them are in, in high school and one's in middle school. So uh, uh, life's pretty fun. we got three of them playing football. One uh, is on a dance team for football. The other one runs cross country. There's my wife. See CME con conference, right? You go on a cruise. you got to get some of those things. So um, yeah, those, that's what I... What I want you to recognize is that this is a normal process. And part of that solution may not be adding something to your day. And may, maybe it's that condition process. Maybe it's part of the educational process that we do starting in undergrad, in med school, in residency. You know, we're, we've been doing it this way for you know, how many years? Maybe that process needs to look different. I don't know. There's a lot of people that are scratching their head, but I think First, we need to help each other recognize as a problem and what gets us there. Any comments or questions or other things to add maybe I didn't say that you thought were important? Yeah. First of all, I want to say thank you. Hey, Dr. Jade, real quick, let me have you. Oh, he's gonna get, she's going to get you a microphone. <laughs> I want to say thank you very much for that presentation. Um, what I wanted to focus on is the vast majority of those that are in this room are in medical school. And you need to know, and we want to make sure that you know, that if you have a concern, an issue, a problem, a, something that you're just having some difficulty coping with or adapting to or adjusting, let somebody know here at the university. We can't help you unless you help us. Tell us. There's no shame, guilt, uh, uh, feeling inferior. It's not a cultural thing. It's if you have a concern, a problem that's bothering you, bring it to one of the counselors, one of the clinical psychologists, one of your mentors, your advisors, and they'll reach out to help get you the help that you need. Again, get over this stigma of, uh-oh, I'm ashamed. Uh, my parents are going to be uh, uh, ashamed of me. Forget it. Our investment is not financial. It's for your success. And the word success means you're going to get through this. You're becoming 
a successful physician as this man has been. So life gets in the way in these processes, and it just happens. So doctor has presented a very thorough, good, and factual um, uh, presentation that's real out there. What he's trying to do to you, or for you, <laughs> is to say, don't let this happen to you in your professional program. It can happen if you don't nip it in the bud, whether you're a student, an intern, a resident, or a clinician practicing medicine. It can happen. So all I'm saying to you is the student support system that the university has is strong. <clears throat> It's not what we had when we went through or Dr. Kamstra went through. We didn't have it. Um, but the university has it. It's on every medical school's radar right now is resilience, angst, de depression, and potential suicide. Who wants that? Nobody wants that. We didn't come here for that. But we're here to help. If you got a concern, bring it forward, but we're not going to know it um, otherwise. Thank you. No, thank you. I think that's the biggest thing that we've, even just this study has done, is it's just allowed us to talk about it. It's allowed us to say it's okay when we're struggling. Um, before, I think a lot of people were, they just, they weren't going to do it. They weren't going to talk about it. And it. It's a big deal. We're here to help each other because you will in practice, you will in your different uh, organizations, you're all going to work together. And we're not here to, you know, undergrad's definitely a little bit different because you're competing to get to these seats. Um, but at the same time, uh, we, you want to build each other up and help each other. We've got a good profession. It is a, a high demand, high stress profession. And I think most people recognize that when they apply to medical school. And so we want to keep it there and, and make it still the good profession that it is. Other comments, questions? That's good. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for coming. Let's give Dr. Kamstra a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, good luck to you all. Just certainly uh, keep working hard. You guys got a lot ahead of you there, but at the same time, you've come a long ways, too.